So here we are going to talk about uh, the latest buzzword, which is generative AI, right? How it's evolving, the relevance for the BFSI sector, and uh, how it's going to impact the security and the privacy aspect. Generally, what we do in case of, um, in case of breakfast meat, generally we pick up emerging topic and then deliberate on that. This format is slightly going to be different. We are going to make it quite participative, and I'll request everyone to participate in that because this topic is so emerging. We at DSI are also exploring uh, how it's going to span out, right? We have conducted multiple rounds of interaction with the security community, with privacy community, and so on and so forth, including the user community. How the workloads are moving on the cloud, on the uh, generative AI, how things are being uh, things are changing and how things will change in future. So considering all of those things, we are still deliberating, we are still exploring what things are going to be in future. So let's make it more interactive. And uh, I have my colleague Aditya also here. He will be joining us for this discussion. Let's take a step back. Let's start with the AI. I think AI, we know every, uh, what is AI, right? Anybody who wants to share what is AI? Anybody? I think it's morning, so we need to wake up now. <laughs> so, any one of you? Okay. So generally, generally, what we say it's uh, if we want to imitate or if we want to create uh, a machine which is which can imitate uh, human uh, intelligence, that is AI, right? Typically, in a generic way, if I say. But again, in AI, we have bifurcated this uh, uh, machine learning, the deep learning, then uh, uh, neural networks, then um, your uh, natural language processing, all of those things, right? Now, if you look at uh, the particularly this uh, machine learning concept, what's happening there? So we are, uh, I'm just referring this for my reference. Uh, we are not using any presentation as such. So when we are leveraging, say, machine learning, what's happening there? We are using data sets, a huge data set probably, to train machine on certain aspects, right? What's happening in case of, uh, say, deep learning? It's leveraging neural network. The now question is, what is the neural network? Again, in a very generic way, we say you have neurons in brain, how that functions, if we can imitate that, that's uh, the neural network. And if, in case of neural network, if we have three layers of that neural networks, probably we'll say, broadly we'll say it is, uh, it is deep learning. Now if we leverage everything and uh, recognize, the, recognize the languages, then we'll say it is uh, natural language processing. If we identify, process it, if we can do that. This is what happened around AI broadly, right? So far, what we are thinking. It took time as well. One aspect that we have to look at here is, why it took time? Couple of things. One is the algorithms which were picking up. The another aspect was the processing power that we have, the infrastructure that we had, right? I'll not go into the specifics, but in case of processing power, in case of infrastructure, what we have seen in last, say, 10 years, Similar amount of change has taken uh, the Moore's principle, if you see, right? That has taken significant time in past, right? That's changing significantly. Another aspect, when this generative AI came, now we'll come to generative AI part without taking too much time on AI and taking a step back. Now, AI took time, but when generative AI came into the play, within a blink of eye, probably it became a new normal kind of thing, right? Everybody start, has started using it. That is also a major change, that, which is, what is happening actually. It's not like technology will come, like mobile came, it took five years or seven years or 10 years time to reach to the masses, right? Not the case with generative AI. The kind of uh, digital inclusion has already happened, what kind of uh, digital literacy people have. Because of that, it's very easy to sort of make sure that things are in hand of uh, everyone, right? That's also a consideration, and why I'm highlighting that, because when we hear, uh, wear the hat of a security or a privacy professional, we have to see that uh, challenge as, not challenge, I would say, that aspect as well. Because the pace, the, typically we call it velocity and uh, volume of the data or the technology flowing and increasing, that also needs to be taken care of while we are wearing a hat of uh, uh, security or privacy professional. So with that backdrop, if we look at what kind of uh, things have uh, uh, have emerged, 
typically and commonly known as speech recognition, then uh, recommendation engine, then uh, computer vision. Uh, no, we are not using any presentation. This is only for my friends. Couple of videos I have that I'll uh, use a separate laptop for that. So those kind of things emerge. But when this uh, AI has in, uh, taken a new shape, now we have seen uh, we have seen those things happening in kind of uh, automated vehicle, right? That's kind of advanced version of that. Now with that backdrop, if we look at what is generative AI, then we'll see. Uh, what's there actually? Anybody who wants to talk about what is generative AI according to you? Anyone? Actually, if you can, uh, using artificial intelligence, if you can generate content, content could be image, it could be text, it could be video, it could be audio, anything. And maybe in future we'll have something else, right? If we can generate content, that is generative AI. How it is generating? It's leveraging your content on which it is being trained, and then leveraging that in, uh, intellect, intellect uh, intelligence, it's generating certain content. Again, one aspect that I'll uh, double click here is there are two types of generative AIs which are commonly emerging. One, or inside the generative AI, two kind of things are emerging. And uh, one is the learning engine, the cognitive part of that, and what uh, uh, I would say, the logical part of that. See, again, in a generic way, if I say, one aspect is when we are learning, right? When machine is ge getting trained, if you look at chat GPT, which is again, new normal kind of thing. It has given a date, before that date it was trained, and now it's not being trained on that data, correct? Now it's generating. So that's the engine which is being trained. So that's one part of this. Second part of the same engine is, it's, it is for public use and people can use it. And at this segment, another thing is happening is, and a couple, uh, couple of enterprises, leading enterprises, they have come up with a, with a uh, with the uh, GPT engines, which are actually learning from your current inputs as well, right? Here comes the privacy challenge that we'll double click again later. What's happening if you're providing certain data, it's again learning, are you uh, ready to give the consent on that data? If you are leveraging that data for your corporate uses, usage, then a uh, lot of sensitive information will be going is it being used for other purposes as well? All those things will come up on that front. But again, this part will uh, take later. What happened in case of uh, generative AI, if we look at uh, that, give me a second. If we look at that part, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, infrastructure, what kind of algorithms were there? Right. So what kind of uh, algorithms and uh, technologies are, were used while they were working on, uh, OpenAI was working on uh, chat GPT for that matter. So again a question, what is GPT? What is the full form of GPT? I think everybody is using uh, chat GPT. Generative pre-trained transformers. Perfect. So how many of you were aware of that? Okay, so that's the, that's the impact of technology. We are using it, but many of us, that too coming from the technology side, we are not bothered to see what's happening actually there, right? And that's actual impacts. If you, if you again, uh, one example for that matter, not related, for that matter, time synchronization. A certain direction everybody would have seen, right? Now if you look at time synchronization, what's the history of time, time synchronization? It's so important. How it is actually, that has, emerged, that's interesting. Many of us may not know that, but that's become the reality and all the machines are in sync, right? I took a slightly different example here. That's the kind of 
uh, emergence that is going to happen in case of these kind of technologies as well. Now, if we look at what kind of technologies it has used, so again, recurrent neural network, Markov chain, Markov chain generally used to take decision what's going to come next. Even in case of, uh, if you take example of text, if there is a flow of text, what would be the next text? What would be the next letter? That's being generated by Markov chain. Again, um, LTSM, which is long-term, short-term memory, and then uh, transformers. So long-term, short-term mem memory in the sense, if you're writing a very complex statement, engine has to understand what to remember and what to forget, broadly again speaking, right? Because uh, generally we write in a natural language processing particularly, if we write something, we write in a very uh, kind of in a flow, right? Many things would not be uh, grammatically correct. Then engine has to understand what it has to learn what it has to forget and accordingly generate a right kind of text, right? Again, here we are not deep diving on these technologies. But one aspect that we have to see in what I have said initially, these, uh, these algorithms, what I just said, it's not something very unique, right? It was there in earlier as well. Then why we are picking up uh, in last couple of years, why this generative AI picked up so much? And again, it is going back to two facts, the technology, sorry, the infrastructure and the processing power. Because these two things have evolved significantly in the last couple of years, the whole paradigm of uh, generative AI or overall AI has changed. And that's the reality. Now, uh, if, you, if you look at um, how we are training, so typical, typically we call about uh, call out uh, reinforcing uh, kind of uh, training of the engine, right? Now, if you look back again, what was happening earlier? A very again, I'm trying to be very generic on various front. Now, how we have learned it? If you go back ancient time when we were training our uh, our uh, pigeons to send the message, what was happening there? We were reinforcing the learning to that. Uh, uh, that creature, right? What was happening? If you do a right thing, we'll give you some food. If you don't do a right thing, we'll punish you. Same thing is happening here in case of uh, reinforcement learning. What's happening? Uh, given a matrix, if that engine is performing good, they are getting some appreciation. If they are not performing good, they are getting some bashing. And accordingly, that engine is learning and generating the text again and again, text or any content again and again, and improving. Now, that was all uh, sort of uh, history that what we have seen. Couple of examples which now moving towards the, the side where we are uh, wearing the hat of security and privacy professional, the challenges and how to address that side. Now, the kind of uh, use cases emerging in Genetive AI, whether it's uh, uh, research around drug, whether research around automobile, whether research around uh, all this content related aspects, whether it's research around the con uh, code generation, all those things are happening, right? Various uh, organizations, for example, Mitsubishi has, uh, I think, um, uh, collaborated with NVIDIA around research uh, around drugs. Then uh, Google recently has come up with uh, some uh, outcome of a research. It, it was some way, I don't remember the exact uh, the research work, but the research which took almost 20 years initially, they came up with that outcome so quickly, leveraging the artificial intelligence and uh, specifically the generative AI. All those things are happening uh, in terms of material science, uh, chip designing, and synthetic data. All those things are being sort of produced by the generative AI. So the kind of, kind of uh, uh, the penetration of generative AI has already happened in case of uh, uh, the corporate, especially the research work, emerging tech, that's quite significant. And that is definitely creating a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, trigger for the discussion on the challenges which we can foresee right now or probably which can come in future. Now, if you look at from the regulation perspective, now we have upcoming data protection bill. What it says, you have to process the data with a consent, right? In case of generative AI, if I remember it correctly, it was around uh, 540 or 570 GB data. That to text, that means it's huge. And uh, several millions of uh, websites were scrolled to create uh, that engine, to learn that, uh, to teach that engine actually, right? Basis that data, it got trained. 
there is a possibility. Again, uh, you can consider it hypothetical. Uh, on the surface web, I'm not talking about the deep web or dark web. On the surface web itself, many times people publishes uh, breach data as well. Now these are personal data. For processing of the personal data, you have to take the consent. Even for the draft data protection bill, what we have, you have to take consent of the, of the owner of the data. Similar things are there in GDPR as well. You have to take consent. Similar thing is there in the PPDA of Canada. You have to take consent, right? How, we, how will we take that consent? Because there is a purpose limitation of the data. And data is uh, available on the surface web because of many reasons. If I have published something as my opinion, right, and if we collate opinion of all the people present over here, this will create a sentiment. And using that sentiment, I can, and that generative AI can create a lot of things. Now, are we taking consent of everyone, though it is published, but to use in a different way, to drive sentiment out of it? Is it, is it a consent or not? It's a deliberation. Uh, it's, a, it's a point of deliberation, I would say, right? One hand, I have published it myself. But I have published it not to be analyzed. That too in a group of 100 people over here, right? That's one part. Now, if you look at um, from the perspective of uh, from the perspective of uh, say children's safety, I think that happened. If I just refer back to my document, it was. Uh, So you would have heard about uh, Italy, ban of chat GPT in Italy. One of the reasons that uh, the government has quoted was uh, the consent taken from the children and the children's safety. Are we taking care of the age bar? Because in GDPR, that, that's one criteria. Are we taking care of that? Because of that, that was one point while they temporarily banned chat GPT, right? After that, uh, OpenAI has come up with some new aspects and they are putting up some uh, bracket before, uh, around that bracket, I think it is 13 to 18 years. There they have to take consent from the parent and consent uh, in terms of usage. All those things are evolving, it's still evolving, right? If you, if you remember a couple of uh, months back when uh, I think uh, chat GPT or such kind of engines were there, even those engines have generated uh, malware codes. Many of you would have heard about it, right? Couple of engines have created that malware codes, which you can anyways leverage it. After that, again, go back to the previous thing, what I said, the reinforcement. Once they have generated, after that they got bashed, not the engine, the technology, that this is the wrong thing, they have carved it. But something happened immediately, right? Again, the phishing is a common example of this. If I take, like, like any, any one of us here are posting on say, social media, right? We are writing, we have a very unique way of writing. Every one of us, we have a unique way of writing. If I just pick up those uh, uh, texts and put it in the engine, train it, and I say, write a phishing mail, not saying phishing, write a mail doing this, 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 in the similar format as this person has written. Now it will give me uh, the same sort of mail it would be almost similar, or maybe in future it's exactly similar what you can write, right? In that sense, the phishing will become so easy. And this is a common example that we, everybody's talking about, right? Phishing mails and very specific and targeted mail being created by those engines, right? Just extend it. Uh, generative AI is not just limited to text, the videos. Now I'm speaking here, and so many of my videos are available in public domain. How much time it will take for an engine which is trained to create some content, a video, along with my audio, which I never said, kind of a deep fake. Learned, now it will be learned based on my voice, my articulation, my way of speaking, and it will generate it. So now if I just show you, Many of you would have probably seen it because what we are this talking about. This year, I figured we could new. do something a little bit different. This and is a core, of uh, course in MIT. Classes, it's a deep learning I course. I figured we could invite someone else from outside the class to do that instead. 
So let's check this out first. Hi, everybody, and welcome to MIT 6S191. How many have, of you have seen it? The course on deep learning on right? here at MIT. So I just pause it. And welcome to MIT. So what happened at the back end, MIT that's being displayed here. I was just trying to reduce the time, but it's not moving. S I don't know why. So somebody else was speaking at the back end, right? Okay. And it was just converting to this. This was a typical deep fake, uh, deep fake example. Not a typical example of generative AI, I would say. But it can be, it can be trained. This is, as we said, generative AI is just an extension of, just an extension of. Uh, AI, and this is example of AI. Extension of that could be more, I would say, sophisticated. Another challenge that you have heard about it, these generative AI or these AI engines are training themselves, right? What happened, and this example of, is of that, it was trained on the Bangla language. I think this case was in Bangladesh, where the engine was not trained on the Bangla language completely, maybe partially, but the whole Bangla language, this engine could have produced, this was Google AI, right? This, it is so sophisticated that without even learning, having understanding of other language probably, or a partial set of information about Bangla language, it could generate the whole AI, in the whole language. And if you see that, and it, there are two pieces of that, how this happens is not well understood. For example, one Google AI program adapted on its own after it was prompted in the language of Bangladesh, which it was not trained to know. We discovered that with very few amounts of prompting in Bengali, so it can now translate all of Bengali. So now all of a sudden, we now have a research effort where we're now trying to get to a thousand languages. You don't fully understand how it works, and yet you've turned it loose on society? Yeah, let me put it this way. I don't think we fully understand how a human mind works either. So, this is a small one, and... Uh, the point is, is still uh, researchers are analyzing how it's learning its own functionality. It's not just Google. It was just one example. It's happening across, right? All the sophisticated engines are learning itself or learning by its own without having even required data sets. And that's kind of sophistication which, are, which is happening right now. And with this backdrop, now, drop, now we can move towards the security and privacy aspect of that. Couple of examples I have already taken, right? how things are evolving, what kind of, um, what kind of challenges uh, it can create, what kind of scenarios it can, uh, scenar scenarios can emerge in future, right? Now, if you replicate it um, with the use cases being already being created by uh, the generative AI, particularly if you look at from uh, the usage perspective, I think this is from one of the, This is kind of uh, the usage pattern which typically came out. This is, I think, from the McKinsey report, right? Typical for, from content writing to chatbots to search to analyze and synthesize the data, code generation, data set generation, all those things are happening, right? Now, if you look at, yeah, it's moving beyond, right? This is all we were talking and we know we are experimenting. But this is all the usage actually, right? This is all uh, what it is generating. But if we see from the tools and technologies being created on top of generative AI, now here you will see this kind of uh, tools and technologies are already there from text perspective, from video perspective, and we have seen how things have changed when startups have started taking that uh, plunge to jump in a particular domain. In India, we have seen for cybersecurity as well. So 10 years back, we have a bunch of 10, 12 startups. Now we have 300 plus uh, Indian cybersecurity companies. It's, a, it's applicable across, right? Wherever you see 
this is kind of innovation happening. This is kind of uh, the tools and technologies are getting uh, evolved. This is just not limited to this. There are more images, code, speech, many other things. We try to double click all those things actually. So it was, it was also sort of, as I said, it's more like exploratory. We are also trying to explore. So Adobe uh, Target is one of the personalized content experience uh, generating AI, uh, engine. This blue conic is one of the uh, machine learning engine to analyze customer data. And these are all, this is kind of blend of AI and ML engines along with the, its movement towards the generative AI, right? Now Chipotle is one of the very uh, known uh, chain in US. Now they are also using it. So see the common uh, usage. And we have bifurcated this whole innovation in the domains. So enhancing sales and marketing, whether it's finance, whether it, uh, it's uh, content creation or customer service, this is just like basic set of things, what's, uh, what is happening here. It could be a long list actually. A team is also working on that. We are trying to collate what kind of things are happening. It is just indicative list, right? Then the idea is, now the idea is if those kind of innovation are happening here, how to make sure that it is, it will remain in the right usage uh, zone itself, right? If you look at uh, financial sector, I think uh, starting from uh, loan processing to customer experience to uh, giving the personalized banking, all those things are already happening. And uh, yeah, those kind of things are happening. Again, just a, just a thought means I, I don't know whether this has already happened or not. Is it feasible? Again, it's a question. Do you think is it feasible to create a kind of a personalized portal or a personalized uh, uh, web page for the individual based on the behavior of that individual so that when we talk about digital inclusion and financial inclusion, just combine these two things. Is it, do you think is it feasible to have a very customized platform or a customized portal based on the individual need, individual's behavior, even for the banks. Do you think it is feasible and what kind of challenges it can create? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think the potential is amazing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with the way how you think about the customized website. But beyond customized website, where I really feel a value is in that 15, 20 pages of the terms and conditions that we sign in, uh, whenever we sign up on something, I think generative AI can easily scan that up and tell me that these are the 10 things that you're accountable for and this is not, right? right. And, and I think that's the first step to take for a customized web experience. At the same time, even in terms to say, what do I interact with it more? And then providing me only that. I think a part of the banks are already doing it, but then you, they don't really use AI for that, but then I think that's the potential for the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello. Yeah, sure. So we have tried using uh, yeah. codes like ChatGPT. If you look at mm -hmm. ChatGPT version 3 or even right, version right. 4 in the Bing right. uh, version, uh -huh. uh, it can automatically generate codes. Right. It can write a code, it can write a custom code, etc. However, from a functionality perspective, uh, it is good that such uh, fraudulent websites can come up. Uh, however, you know, my, my, uh, my thought is from a security perspective. Mm -hmm. We tried it from a security perspective also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tried to do uh, uh, offensive security, but there are limitations. So most of the chat GPT version three or four, whatever it is, cannot do offensive security, right? So uh, we are still in business uh, because of uh, that uh, limitation. Right. Secondly, the uh, point is that most, many of those uh, uh, results in from the chat are not accurate. So we have tried this even in the latest version of the Bing-based uh, ChatGPT4. If you search for security parameters, like the latest version of 27001, it still shows 2013 version, whereas we have updated 22 version uh, updated in October. So many of those, uh, the reliability factor 
is still a question mark. You may get some information, but you need to validate it and cannot depend totally on those uh, generative AIs. As you know, I mean, many companies say, oh, it's coming from G uh, ChatGPT, so it should be accurate. That's, uh, that may not be correct. And we need to set our expectations from such tools. That's what matters. Sure. So, again, uh, what I was asking, because it can generate code, it can learn based on your behavior, right? Is it possible to give you a customized app itself? So whenever you are going to access an app, it will give you so customized uh, uh, interface, which is actually meant for you, because it can generate code. It, it can learn from what you are doing. Do you think any, again, this is hypothetical. I don't know if it's happening. If anybody knows, please do let me know. But so, uh, no, 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 I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the interface itself. For example, uh, for example, what used to ha happen or what's happening in the, the malls, you will find certain products at certain location. Why? Because they know, they have analyzed it, who goes where. Where is the women clothes, where is the men clothes, where is the kids clothes, and where is the, the rack of soaps or perfume. It's very uh, well decided and defined, right? What I'm saying, based on the behavior of individual, if we can make that interface so flexible, it keeps changing every time when you are coming, based on the learning. So, mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, almost all these uh, social media platforms right. will give you a differential experience. So if you, if I open my Netflix mm -hmm. and my wife opens her Netflix, mm -hmm. it's going to be completely different. Okay. So let me add another layer, layer here actually. Again, not going to securities as of now. What if the way of authentication will be different for you and different for me in the app based on the preference? It's, I mean, I have not uh, experienced it. So uh, I have a point here. Yeah. Um, so the personalization aspect that you're saying on the UI front, mm -hmm. uh, you know. No, not I'm, only UI actually, experience front. It's not only the interface. I'm saying even the, at authentication level, mm -hmm. if that can be personalized. So what we are doing in this segment is, you know, uh, we are kind of in coming in between the application Mm -hmm. the front end and the large language model mm -hmm. and we are kind of providing a rule based policy based mm -hmm. guardrail right mm -hmm. and that's where you know the whole experience of the role of a particular role and a policy which applies to that role mm -hmm. changes so for example let's say uh, this is not from the finance industry right. but uh, from a healthcare point of view let's say in a hospital setting a doctor is not allowed to query the large language model mm -hmm. uh, asking, uh, you know, can I give or what is the dosage of a particular drug I can give to a patient. Correct, correct. Right? But from a compliance point of view, the compliance officer can have that information mm -hmm. because he needs to, you know, know that what are the drugs and what are the dosages of it. So that is a role-based policy enforcement mm -hmm. that comes in. So from an experience point of view, the, you will have some information as per your role, which you will have access to, and some which you will not have access to. So this okay. is what is one way of going around it. The second is the hallucination part, which uh, he was talking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So on the hallucination part also, there are ways to you know, vet if a particular reply is, you know, is true or it is hallucinated. Mm -hmm. So sure. I mean, there are... Ma uh, so, if I come from your experience uh, perspective, not really at the authentication layer, but more at the middle layer of, you know, like a guardrail between the large language model and the uh, main application that is there. So, that's one of the ways of doing it. Okay, sure. Thanks. So, where I was coming from this actually, or where I was going from this actually, is the compliance aspect and the evolution of technology. If something, and I took a very generic example, uh, if that kind of things are happening, now especially in, I said banking sector, one of the most regulated one, right? Now if such kind of things are happening, definitely it will have a lot of implications from the regulation. But from the digital inclusion perspective, if you see, that's going to create all together a different uh, opportunity 
of the of enabling digital inclusion right the people who are not just not limited to languages right based on how he can or she can experience that thing starting from uh, the uh, the interface to the back end if we can alter alter everything or uh, weave around everything based on the need definitely it will go, it it's going to increase the adoption right but at the same time the compliances the technology uh, innovation and the i would say the technology usage that will significantly cha uh, be changed so now what do you think for such kind of adoptions where we are personalizing too much again from the privacy perspective definitely in such cases we may take consent right but today what i'm for what i'm taking consent may change for the usage tomorrow particularly in this case we don't know how we going to use it tomorrow but it's good for the community so how to establish that balance that is one question from the privacy perspective can we take the blanket uh, consent it's not given in the laws and anywhere i don't say that uh, blanket uh, consent is given the second is the compliances because this compliance part will definitely going to restrict many times at the same time uh, do you think any changes are required from the compliance perspective yeah excuse me mike uh, so so there's two ways of looking at it mm -hmm. right one i feel the entire thing about consent has to change mm -hmm. right the entire notion of consent has to change we need to have newer definitions of how we define consents and how we use the data because people who are going to use the data are still going to use the data either right. as a model or either in their own ways of giving you things so mm -hmm. that is one but what i am more concerned is about as you use your data to train your model there could be a lot of derived data that can f in future come in right mm -hmm. as you as you keep pumping those data mm -hmm. into the model there can be situations where some responses may be someone's pii so that is where the challenges are uh, but but i don't think so we should dig a lot about compliance and uh, and and consent to be very specific because that definition needs to evolve okay but uh, if we don't look at again just a thought yeah. if we don't look at it will create regulatory uncertainty no that's true right so, i mean uh, again for whatever we talk about from a hipaa or from pci or yeah. those compliances mm -hmm. yes right i mean mm -hmm. companies should understand that they don't train the data with someone's pii right but but what i'm trying to say is beyond in the in the first point that you also made about the information that's already there right today if i'm putting something on facebook and i can i can, I can never come back to say that oh, which i checked in in mumbai so i don't want anyone else to use that information right i mean whatever you put it out you put it out with that risk in mind so what i'm trying to say is that consent of what i give should not just be for facebook it should be for a common consortium of somewhere right which means that someone can always use that information and, and and make sense out of it that's what i meant to say in terms of specifically about consent so uh, the intelligence uh, pl can play an important role uh, in security functions uh, some of the examples are uh, for example so certain people use uh, biometric or uh, fingerprint for authentication certain people use otps so based on the behavior uh, the authentication pattern can be uh, offered that you are always using uh, a fingerprint so you can use this instead of say uh, putting otps or something like that secondly uh, i have never seen uh, kind of uh, things like uh, based on the location or based on the geography of the person uh, the validations are changed or the encryption patterns or mechanisms are changed because certain regulations require stringent uh, data protection and uh, somewhere uh, the kind of uh, uh, performance uh, is uh, more uh, kind of preferred so in that case based on the re different requirement and behavior pattern of the user we can uh, create a set, uh, this in uh, use this intelligence to build system so that it can adopt all these changes on runtime that is not adopt adaptive uh, way of i think uh, these kind of things probably happening right first part uh, given your uh, say behavioral engine that can predict that right and the second part in terms of changing uh, say authentication le levels i would say based on the geography 
even for the transactions, or typically what you used to have, right? You given your location, current location, and from where you are doing the authentication, generally it uh, matches. There were certain cases as well around this actually, where they have matched it and accordingly the anomaly got detected. That you are logging in from say US and you are sitting here in India. Yes, that is or happening. You are checked in in uh, your office and uh, login is happening from US. Those kind of anomaly detections are there actually. But uh, yeah, good, uh, you mentioned this point. I have one. Uh, so, what regulations mm -hmm. the right? Uh, so suppose uh, regulations are very defined right now, mm -hmm. I think that anomaly is. So, for example, uh, we talk about inclusion. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. But that is again, if you see, that's again kind of uh, uh, the reinforcement learning for that engine, right? Sometimes. What happened in case of uh, machines or engines generating malware codes? Once it's generated, then we learned, okay, it can do this as well. This is not good for the community. It's, a, it's a, again reinforcement learning for that engine. It got bashed, it was struck down, right? But how much? Correct, correct. Correct. So again, the question is back to the same point. Say, so what kind of data you are providing to that engine? Because what's happening right now to train that engine? Again, accuracy of data is also one of the major point. What was there? Yeah. What was not there earlier, now we have. Be because of various kind of platforms what we have, the kind of accurate data. I was coming to that point only. Coming to that point only, see. If you provide a certain set of data, let's take uh, X GB of data you are providing to that engine to be trained. Now out of which 80% of data and you are analyzing just sentiment, which color is good. Now 80% of data is itself dominated and it's not uh, what we call it like um, uh, the sort of, uh, uh, what do you call it in a statistical term that is a generic uni uniform so, data, right? So thick data, thick data. Yeah. So, which is not like uh, taken from a certain set of people. For example, here if we ask, this is all security and privacy community, if you ask privacy is important, yes. Everybody will say yes. Right, so. so nay, from the compliance perspective, na, I have one point. Hello. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, so, what I would like to add to this is mm -hmm. compliance and regulations only always are a, uh, a follow-up game kind of. Mm -hmm. Once the technology comes in, only then the compliances and regulations come. That's the point I'm so, trying to make. So, so what happened initially from the technology side, it took time to become okay. the reality and for mass, mass adoption. Now so in case of chat... Example, for example, I'll go back uh, maybe to the Google uh, Street View program, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which was there. India right. didn't accept it for long because of various security reasons and all. Correct. That. But ultimately it's come here also, right? So mm -hmm. uh, start. that is... Once you have the regulations in place, probably you, people will be accepting it better. So you need regulations to, in fact, uh, say where are the boundaries, what is the limits to what it can go up to, mm -hmm. right? Even generative AI, uh, from a security perspective, I think, uh, it can help security, but what Correct. is the security for generative AI, that also has to be considered. Maybe Absolutely. Uh, yeah. one uh, way of uh, approaching this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, a tool uh, that compliance people can look at is uh, how deep fake for example you, mm -hmm. you showed the video on deep fake mm -hmm. um, uh, there the deep fake the algorithm which generates mm -hmm. uh, the deep fake image called as generate uh, adversarial network correct can it itself has got two elements in it mm -hmm. one is the synthesizer which yeah. makes up a, a image 
another is a discriminator, discriminator. which uh, says whether it is true or not correct. true, whether correct. this is detectable or not detectable. Correct. Correct. Uh, and, and this escalates into multiple levels. The, right. the game between the discriminator as well as the synthesizer. Mm -hmm. uh, so the job of the discriminator is to detect the synthesized image as a synthesized image. Uh, right. And, and uh, the best way to handle AI, it seems, uh, as uh, it stands right now, we don't have any other mechanism to identify deepfake as much as a GAN discriminator can do. Uh, correct, so even correct, if we correct. were to detect if a fake image is a fake image, Just to add you need to actually. employ the GAN discriminator. And right. similarly, here uh, in the uh, generated uh, text, mm -hmm. if you uh, have to determine whether the text uh, is a true representation of the data mm -hmm. or a hallucinatory representation of a data, we still have to employ uh, to some extent uh, the AI which itself generates it. And, and uh, this approach is not entirely correct, but this is one uh, tool in the arsenal. Okay. Mm -hmm. so can, can I, yeah, sure. Can I? If this works, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Vikram. Uh, so, you know, I, uh, I'm just uh, trying to understand here and trying to put my inputs here. So now AI, uh, since being uh, you know part of the society, mm -hmm. and I strongly believe the security risk of AI can be managed by AI itself. Can't it happen that you have an AI which uh, manage, uh, which have let's say user experience modifications, user base that we initially put? Right. Can we have an AI who can manage consent based on modifications? Mm -hmm. So risk of AI can be managed by AI. I strongly believe no AI can be unbiased. Mm -hmm. It will be always biased. And there are a lot of uh, discoveries uh, right now, a lot of, I think, work being done. In, in fact, Google have published a lot of articles where their AI start, you know, uh, being, start being racist at one time in time. In fact, if you look at the user experience part, if you're coming back to that original question of yours, uh, there have been a video circulating on LinkedIn, if you have, might have seen a lot of you, that uh, there's a football match happening, and one geography sees a different kind of ad, and another geography sees right. different kind of advertisement, while the football match is the same. Mm -hmm. So content, uh, you know, uh, modification or uh, experience enhancement based on such kind of geographical is all already happening. Correct. So there's no way that people are not working on the same. Mm -hmm. There are things happening. It is just that we have to understand the risk. And if you have to manage those risk, you have to have AIs to manage those risk. Uh, then I think we'll have a better or at, a, at least a safer society. Thank you. Sure. So yeah. now we have just a couple of minutes left. So I'll try to move towards the good part of that. But before that, I think it was a Google and a Stanford University's program where they created a virtual town of uh, AIs, right? And again, this is a publicly available example. Many of you would have seen that. Where what happened actually, again, quickly telling you, it was uh, bots that came. If you remember, there was a, there was a game used to happen, Farmville or something, right? So something of the similar sort, they have brought everyone together. Now those uh, AI engines, the bots, started engaging with each other. They have started sharing the emotions. They have started generating their languages and everything. This is kind of a thing that happened. And it is all, it is all self-learning by that bot itself. Right? There are many, many such examples yeah. available. And uh, what's happening? If that uh, town can be created and become a kind of a natural, human-led town kind of thing, the see the power in a consolidated way, those engines can create. Same example what uh, uh, Mr. Pichai said, right? It's difficult to understand how uh, human brain functions, right? And this is of the similar nature. How they are functioning, we need to learn that. We need to understand that. But that's just a couple of uh, scenarios. And a lot of good things are happening. One of uh, colleague here just said, 
say in case of fraud detection, anomaly detection, all those things are being sort of taken care by uh, this uh, generative AI engine so easily, right? In terms of productivity, in terms of, say, BFSI, if you see so many things are happening where generative AI can be leveraged significantly, right? All those customer engagements, personalized services, uh, even, even for... Uh, even for loan processing or uh, your uh, all the transactions and everything. At the same time, it can help you identify the anomalies, as I said, using what you just said, in case of uh, this uh, uh, synthesizer, as well as the discriminator engines, you can identify what is correct and what is not correct. You can identify those things as well. So such th kind of things are already happening. At the same time, the important thing that we have to look at is how the data is being used, right? What kind of data and the ethics of AI is already being discussed significantly. So that's one part, but at the same time, what kind of data is coming in? Is that data is intacting the privacy principles of that particular geography as at large as well, just not limited to the laws, but if it is not going to impact anyone. Those kind of considerations are important. Say, when these engines are getting trained from the surface web, again, we are not moving to the dark web and deep web, even from the surface web, as I initially said, there is a possibility somebody would publish the personal information which is being breached somewhere, right? Now it is becoming part of that, uh, the learning engine. If it is being trained on the research works, which may not, which could be a uh, violation of uh, copyright, right? Somebody published it. These kind of things are feasible. Now, how it is being utilized and how my data, which is, as a, as a corporate now, if you see, my data, what I am uploading, how it is being leveraged in terms of its learning and what portion of that data is going to be shared once somebody else will generate a text next time or a content next time. All those things have to be taken care. In terms of regulations, generally we see uh, once technology is there, then based on the repercussions, based on the usage, we define the regulations, right? But here, things are moving on the blinks of eye, right? There was a date when there was nothing called chat GPT. People were not aware about it. And again, here, the technocrats are here, not this community, probably in general. People were not. Now, today, just a couple of months down the line, everybody is using that, right? You will see people are writing mails, people are just writing their... Uh, even kids are writing their uh, homeworks as well, right? So those kind of things are happening. So mass adoption. At that level, how fast we can create and upgrade our regulations? We need to come up with some new suggestions. And here, this is the idea what, why we have uh, sort of created these sessions. We are also sort of coming up with our thought process on that. We are building that. And at DSCI, it's only possible if we all come together and uh, start building that thought process. The learning from each one of you probably contributed back to the building that holistic uh, approach around it, right? Whether from the technology perspective, whether from the policy perspective, or overall, um, uh, I would say, adoption and uh, whether it's ease of doing business, productivity, all of those things. If we take all those three or four buckets together, here we are trying to explore and we are trying to build our thought process. How can we make it a, flu a very... Uh, won't call it foolproof, but uh, a conducive ecosystem for the technology and for the businesses to adopt it and also to flourish with those technologies which are emerging. Yeah, please. Uh, so, sir, I had a point. Uh, I wanted to ask about it. Sure. As you would say, as you said, we need to impose regulations on AI. So no, we are not saying we have to impose. Okay. I didn't say that. Okay, so we need regulations to be complied by, for monitoring the AI, right? No, we didn't say that. Okay. So I want to know, like, do we need to monitor the AI technologies regularly and do we need to com uh, comply any regulations on them? So the thing is, we need to make sure that usage is not harming anyone, not creating any harm for anyone, right? That's the intent. Again, two thoughts here. First, the ethics of AI is definitely in discussion, right? We are looking at how to make sure that uh, AI is being used in a very ethical way. It's not biased, right? It's good for the community and not creating any harm. Same what we were talking about. If an engine generating malware codes, it's not correct, right? So that engine has to stop it. 
they will definitely do it if it's a genuine and legitimate uh, providers. They will do it as well. But at the same time, if you limit or uh, curve the technology evolution itself, the technology itself will not evolve. So we have to have a very fine balance between these two things. If we start, say, just assume, uh, if we put all the stringent norms for the startup ecosystem, right? What we have for that matter, a large enterprise. If we put all those norms for the small players, it won't flourish. So we have to have a very conducive ecosystem for that startup ecosystem. Again, I'm taking a different example. The conducive ecosystem for that particular segment so that they can come up with the, with the new ideas, innovations, and everything that can contribute back to the society, the whole ecosystem. It's only possible if we allow them to grow. If we curb them at the first level, it won't grow. Right? But at the same time, let's not open so much that few, because everything is not fair, right? So few probably illegitimate elements will create nuisance and that will again impact the rest of the world, right? Sorry? That's for particularly for generative AI, even we are trying to explore that part, what could be that fine balance? That's what we are doing and that's what we are trying to do, not here, otherwise as well. Anybody of you, if you are interested in, yeah, anybody of you, if you are interested in contributing to such discussions, feel free to reach out to us. We are open to such discussions, even we can set up a time separately. After going from here, we can discuss and whenever we make certain uh, recommendations to government or even building the understanding at industry level, we definitely incorporate those things. Please. Sorry, you are not audible. We can take it offline as well because I can see time is up. I have already closed uh, 9.30. Right, right. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's just like, uh, say for example, say encryption. I'll take uh, again a very basic example. I try to be very generic in my discussion. Let's take uh, encryption. So there is a arrangement called Vasenar arrangement which is talking about, or even uh, for any dual use technologies, right? So encryption itself is a dual use. We are not going to stop it, right? We are going to use it. Again, we need to have a fine balance where it's going and whose hand is going and how that entity, individual, or set of people are going to use it. Again, it's, a, it's not a binary debate, I would say. It has to be a very, uh, I would say, thoughtful and uh, in-depth debate on that what all that we need to define to say this is correct, this is not correct, right? And uh, we have to cover the complete gamut. And that's why it has to be, I would say, a very diverse set of stakeholders coming together and thinking about it. Encryption, as I said, it can be for uh, civilian purposes, all we are doing. Probably here, if uh, we have any automated uh, home automation system placed, it will have encryption, right? But at the same time, it can be used for various other purposes, right? How are we, go how are we going to define that uh, thin line or blurred line between these two things? It has to be deliberated. Encryption, we have probably found out a way. In our uh, 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 export control regime in India, as well as, as we are part of WASNR, we have very clearly defined it. But this is something which is emerging, and we have to find out a Again, the fine balance between these two things. So as I said earlier, feel free to reach out to us for any input, any deliberation you want. We have conducted various round of uh, interaction. We'll keep doing it. And this is here in Mumbai, I think this is first time, right? Uh, yeah, in Mumbai we have done it first time. Probably in person we'll again do it uh, shortly. And uh, happy to see you again in those deliberations. Here we try to be a bit generic, but next time we'll be in depth in terms of uh, picking up a specific subject, subject and deep diving those uh, aspects in that, right? So thank you for joining us today. And uh, again, we'll be here. Let's enjoy the FinSec Conclave, attend all the sessions. We have innovation box in the evening. So join us for that. We'll be trying to sort of uh, look at six startups who got shortlisted. So FinSec, uh, sorry, this innovation box,
is completing 10 years and uh, here we have added a new flavor of uh, financial sector in this. So six startups having some use cases in financial sector security, they will be competing. It's a live contest. Even audience will have a voting pad to contribute uh, to identify that uh, winner. So please do join. It is at uh, 5.30 onwards in the main hall itself. Sure, thank you. Thanks a lot for joining us.